Tudor fashion. What did the Tudors wear? The Tudors reigned from 1485 until 1603 and the fashions changed throughout the period. We will concentrate on how many of the queens and consorts, the celebrity influences of their day, contributed to that change. However, we know very little about how the ordinary Tudors would have dressed, and most of our knowledge comes largely from the portraits that were made of the royal and noble members of Tudor society. Very few original garments have survived from this time, but we will share with you some of the rare survivors that have, and they might surprise you. The Tudors, the original power dressers. Once you had the shift, stockings and corset, next came the kirtle. The kirtle was a piece of dress that was used from the Middle Ages. It was usually worn over the chemise, that is, under the outer garments. It was part of fashionable dresses in the 16th century and remained so for some time amongst the middle classes as well. This loose garment changed to fitted support garments in the 14th century. Later kirtles could be constructed by combining a fitted bodice with a skirt gathered or pleated into the waist. By the 1530s, this changed to just a skirt and a corset instead of the fitted bodice. Kirtles could be embellished with a variety of decorations including gold, silk and tassels. This was a form of power dressing and part of rich Tudor women's armour. Partlet is a fashion accessory of the 16th century. The partlet was a sleeveless garment worn over the neck and shoulders or to fill in a low neckline. The earliest partlets appeared in the late 15th century fashion. They were made of silk or linen and were worn to fill in the low V necklines of both men and women's Burgundian dress. Men continued to wear partlets, usually of rich materials, with the low cut doublets of the early 16th century. Early 16th century partlets were made in a variety of fabrics and colours, although black was most popular. Black partlets, when of the gown, usually of velvet or satin for the upper classes, are an early style. A wardrobe warrant of June 1538 ordered black velvet for a French partlet for Princess Mary. These black parlettes may be seen in a number of portraits of Tudor court ladies by Hans Holborn the Younger, as well as in Neverlandish paintings of market women. Fine lawn linen partlets with small standing collars and ruffles could be worn directly over a low neck smock or over the kirtle. The Pelican portrait of Elizabeth I shows the Elizabethan fashion for matching partlet and sleeves worked with black work embroidery, in this instance covered with a sheer layer of cypress decorated with narrow strips of gold lace. Such sets of partlet and sleeves were common New Year's Eve gifts to the Queen. In 1562, Lady Cobham gave her a partlet and pair of sleeves of cypress wrought with silver and black silk. Finally, the gown itself, made of fine silks and velvet and embroidery, are placed on top of the other layers. The sleeves were often separate and made of silk embroidery or black work and could also have a fur layer. This outer layer would be highly embellished. Here are some rare 16th century survivors. was one of the most common pieces of headwear worn by women and sometimes by men as well throughout the 16th century. It appears in many paintings of both nobility and the common folk. Actual examples of Tudor coats, however, are hard to find. 
it is likely that a coif or close-fitting cap of some sort was worn underneath the heavy and concealing veils and English gable hoods of the 1520s and 30s, and the lighter French hoods that followed them, but all that would show of a coif worn underneath a hood or veil would be the front edge. It is very difficult and sometimes impossible to tell whether or not the ruffle border of a gable or French hood is attached to the hood or is the edging of a coif worn underneath. The only clear depictions of a Tudor coif appear in some sketches by Hans Holborn, drawn in the 1530s, one of Anne Boleyn herself. The front edge is far back on the crown, with tabs on either side coming forward past the jawline. The front edge is also wired with a heavy wire, presumably to keep its shape and to keep it on the head. The line of the coif follows quite closely the line of the gable and transitional hoods worn at the time, a good indication that the coif was worn underneath a hood as well as by itself. As the century progressed, English and French hoods became smaller and more dainty until they hardly covered a woman's hair at all. A young gentlewoman in the late 1560s would often wear a French hood type headdress placed daintily back on her head, allowing her to show off the bouffant rolls at her brow, which were becoming more and more popular at this time. She could choose to wear many other items of headwear as well, among them flat hats, tall hats, pillbox shaped hats, vowels, and a variety of other decorative billiments perched atop a lady's coiffure. Although respectable women still had their hair covered, albeit by nothing more than a small cawl and transparent veil, a woman's hair began to be considered an asset to be displayed rather than something to be hidden away beneath a bulky hood. Queen Elizabeth's pride in her red hair has something to do with this. Many women would frizz, bleach and dye their hair to approximate the Queen's curly red locks. At the beginning of the Tudor period, gable hoods, so named because the top of the hood resembles the gable of a house, with long lappets, the decorative sides of the hood, were the order of the day as seen in the 15th century copies of portraits by Elizabeth of York. As the decades went on, the lappets on the side of the gable hood reduced in length from past shoulder level to chin level, as seen in contemporary portraits of Catherine of Aragon. Anne Boleyn was instrumental in popularising French hoods in the 1520s, which were rounder in shape and shorter than the gable hoods, allowing more hair to peek out. The introduction of the French hood to England, which came about once Mary Tudor, who was Queen of France, and Anne Boleyn returned to the English court from France in the 1520s and after Mary was widowed. Indeed, French hoods became so associated with Anne Boleyn that the period just after her downfall and execution saw a brief return to the more modest gable hoods. The English gable hoods were favoured by her short-lived successor, Jane Seymour, who banned her ladies from wearing the French hood, much to the chagrin of many courtiers. John Hutton, writing to Lady Lille, said that he had seen her daughter Anne the day before in a gable hood, which I thought became her nothing so well as the French hood, but the Queen's pleasure must be done. Jane's death, only 18 months later into her reign, allowed for a return to the popular style, and Henry VIII's final two wives, Catherine Howard and Catherine Parr, were both depicted wearing the French hood. During her brief reign in the 1550s, Mary I favoured a style of French hood with a squared shape. Elizabeth I also wore hoods in her youth and early on in her reign, but as the 16th century came to an end, hoods fell out of fashion almost entirely. 
decades after Jane Seymour's use of Gable Hood as a statement of court politics, Anne Boleyn's daughter, the future Elizabeth I, began to dress in all black and white at the court of her half-sister, Mary I. The choice was not merely based on style. It was intended as a subtle yet deliberate way to show her support for the Protestant faction, a group that skewed opulent dress and opposed her Catholic sister. By aligning herself with Protestant faction via her dress, Elizabeth was set herself up as an heir to rival her sister's strong commitment to Catholicism, indicating the differences a potential Elizabeth reign could bring in. This version of the future Elizabeth I, in deliberate, simple and subdued dress, couldn't contrast more with her popular vision of her in the later Gloriana years of her reign, covered in opulent jewels, with uncovered, hoodless hair decorated with jewels and diadems. So while that plain style of dress did not necessarily stick, it served an important political purpose at the time. The black and white colour scheme, however, had more staying power. While Elizabeth did introduce lots of rich colours into her wardrobe as Queen, she did retain an affinity for black and white gowns, which she used as symbolism for her role as the Virgin Queen. So the rich Tudors, their clothes, were they just fashion? Were they just to show off their wealth? Were they a political weapon? What do you think? Please let us know in the comments below. Please subscribe, like or click on the bell to be notified of other upcoming videos. Thank you for watching. See you soon.